new development on refinements of schemes of points over a three. Okay, so is everything working? Like for the Zoom people? Okay. So right. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for letting me talk here. Uh, I am gonna talk about uh, a note that I'm writing together with Johannes. Uh, this is supposed to be a very informal talk, and also uh, I'm not like we are not in this note. We are not uh, trying to prove like a new technical result or something, but we are trying to like uh, point out some relations and draw attention to some uh, uh, phenomena, phenomena that happen in this, uh, with this enumerative invariance, right? So before I start defining stuff and talking about the problem itself, I want to give like a quick overview of what I want to talk about. So I will say some words that I will define later in the talk, but it's gonna be okay. So the, this story starts with this motivic the thing variance. Uh, these are refinements of the DT invariants, and these are defined in a ring, which for now, which is called like motivic ring of weight or something like this. And this ring is actually a localization of the Grothendieck ring of varieties, which I'm gonna define very soon. But elements in this ring are isomorphism classes of varieties. Uh, and one natural morphism you have here is the Euler characteristic with compact support. So when you, of course, like if you have a variety, you can compute its Euler characteristic and then you have like a morphism to Z. And of course, like by via this morphism, you should recover like classical DT invariant from these motivic ones. And another thing that you have here is the class of the affine line, which we will denote by L during this talk. And one thing that we uh, realize that happens very often is that when you consider this kind of invariants, uh, even though you are working over C, uh, the same formulas you get for this motivic invariants can be used it to get results over R. And so for example, for the main example in this talk, which is the Hilbert scheme of points uh, or the or A3, right? Because if you want to compute the thing variance of A3, the space, the moduli space you want to like degree zero invariance, the moduli space you want to consider is the Hilbert scheme of points and A3. And in this case, so for for A3, what we get is the following formula that I'm gonna write here. So uh, this should be this. Minus n over two, e to the n minus one. So you get this formula, and this this formula was computed by uh, Behrend, Bryant, Vendroy. But they use the techniques that only work over C. But in any way, you get this formula. And one thing that we realize is that, I mean, this could be defined not only here, but also in this the same ring, but considering varieties over R or even over K, right? And and then if you compute the same Euler characteristic here, but over R, you get real invariants, which were computed by uh, Walcher, Krefel, and Paschetti. Uh, so this was one thing that that's me. It's not. It's kind of surprising because like this, these numbers were computed using techniques over C, 
And of course, you could even consider uh, over k. And now I uh, can refer to Sabrina's talk because over k, you can consider the A1 Euler characteristic with compact support and get some results here. Uh, now, uh, the thing is that, so, so in this talk, I want to talk about this stuff. Like I will explain how these are defined, uh, modulus some technicalities and how these numbers or these uh, formulas were computed. Uh, but we don't have a good answer for why this uh, counts work over R, but we have some conjectures, let's say, or ideas. And basically you want to kind of pose some questions and see if anyone can answer and help us in this sense. So, right. So this is more or less a overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so let's start uh, talking about DT invariant. So some people already like talked a little about DT invariant. I'm also not gonna spend too much time on this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, T, no, no, uh, okay. So L is my refinement parameter and T uh, is just, because this is a generating series. Yeah, sorry, uh, I, I actually didn't explain this properly. So, of course, you get uh, you get this this invariant, but uh, you you can consider like this for any. You are looking at degree zero invariants, but you could take the invariants with any for any n, right? For n number of points, and t is the generating series parameter. So, so this is a generating series of the thing variants for A3. Yeah, 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 exactly. So perfect. So if you take L equals one, so you, you're gonna get exactly the McMahon function, right? And if you take L equals, sorry, if you take L equals one, you get the McMahon function. If you take L equals minus one, then you get uh, the symmetric McMahon function, which are the real. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't uh, explain it. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. And okay, so the thing variants. Uh, so I think many people already talked about this, but uh, the the thing is that basically <clears throat> we are considering for some variety X and some uh, homology class beta, we are looking at ideal sheaves. Uh, and here I'm gonna write Y to be the variety, the subscheme uh, induced by this ideal. And we want, uh, why to have class beta and uh, we want the Euler characteristic of the shift to be. I mean, this is the classical definition of this. This is a moduli space and the thing variants of n beta are defined to be the integral of a virtual class defined on this modulized place and modulized space, right? So of course, and now that's the important thing, if this space is smooth, for example, this is simply uh, uh, the Euler characteristic uh, of, of your space. Now, the thing is that in, uh, or, or up to a sign. So there is also a sign here, which is minus one to the dimension of X. Uh, yeah, so the thing is that if we consider beta equals zero, 
then we are going to get simply the Hilbert scheme of n points in our x. So if beta equals zero, this in is the Hilbert scheme of n points over x uh, of x. And, and then, or maybe I will write n here. And then we can, and that's why, I mean, the Hilbert scheme of points will play a role in our story. Uh, because we we want to to consider, I mean, the main example we are gonna work is for degree zero invariant. So the Hilbert scheme of points will be important. And now I'm gonna, so, okay, these are the invariants and now I'm gonna explain how to get this motivic refinement refinement of, of this invariant. And okay, this is where things start to get a little more interesting. So the idea is that <clears throat> we have this Grothendieck ring of varieties. And this ring is simply <clears throat> given by, is denoted by this. So, okay. Uh, bar K. And this is the free abelian group generated by uh, isomorphism classes of varieties over k and and there are some relations actually there is only one relation which is the following uh, so for any variety x if you take a closed subvariety of X, then you can write this relation X is Y plus the, this is the uh, complementary variety. So, so in the end, like when you are summing varieties here, plus is in some sense the union, right? So you are making the union of two varieties and you can also define a product, which is simply, the Cartesian product. And okay, for now, uh, this this ring, as I as a okay, so this ring, as I kind of uh, uh, made clear here, this can be defined over any K, but uh, it's important to say that we are gonna work mainly uh, with characteristic zero because there are some results that only work in characteristic zero here. So let's, so think of K as a field of characteristic zero, but yeah, so, okay. Right. Okay, so uh, we'll keep going. So okay, so we have some properties of this ring which are gonna be important. So the first thing is that two classes are the same if you have a bijective morphism. So even if you don't have an isomorphism, but only a bijective morphism, you already have equality. And also, if you have uh, a fiber bundle, so E over B with fiber F, uh, then you have that the class of E is the same as E and F. So of course, this should be 
uh, locally trivial in the Zariski topology. Okay, and and two important facts is that, and an, another important fact is that this is so this is generated by all uh, all isomorphism classes of varieties, but uh, there is a theorem uh, that you can that was shown by by Bittner that this this ring. Uh, can be generated by projective variety uh, with the following relation relations and these relations are that uh, X minus Y minus T. E. So this this simply means that okay. So it, this is a relation. So this is the blow up of X along Y, and this is the exceptional divisor. So the theorem just says that you can consider the abelian group generated by only projective or isomorphism classes of projective varieties with this relation. And this is gonna be isomorphic to that ring of all varieties. And for this, you need characteristic zero. So you can do this without characteristic zero. Uh, yeah, so uh, now, of course, if you look at these rings, you can define uh, so now if you take K equals to C, you can define, of course, this Euler characteristic of compact support to Z, like simply by taking the Euler characteristic. If K equals R, you also can do that, the same thing uh, over also to Z. And well, as I'm gonna say in a moment, you can, as you have this, uh, you could also consider this like in the Grothendieck V ring, but this I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And now I can also define this MK, which is simply gonna be this ring of varieties over K with L. So remember that L is the class of the affine line. And this is gonna be uh, localized. And lo the, the square root of this class is gonna be localized. So I adjoint this extra class here, and then this is gonna be MK. And notice that uh, uh, now as we have this L to the minus a half, if you want, of course, you can extend this or maybe MC to Z simply by sending this to minus one because, well, of course, this is going to be one. This, so the real one, let me write like this. The real one is going to be minus one the Euler characteristic with, with compact support. And so here you can just extend by sending L, L to the half to minus one. But here, if you consider the real version, you have to consider an extension of the, the integers because of course, this is gonna be square root of minus one. And then you have to consider this, uh, this extension of the integers. So, but I mean, this is not really a problem in this context. Okay. And uh, maybe, well, maybe I can write some examples of simple things that we can do. So the class of the projective space is gonna be the class of the, uh, many affine spaces 
plus one, right? Because you can always consider like the affine chart and then you have like an affine line in the infinity and then you have like another affine line, then you sum. Uh, of course, you could also, you can also do a similar thing for the Grossmannian and then you're gonna get like a, another combination of L's. And if you look at these formulas, of course, uh, you're gonna, well, you, you can, you're gonna see that if you compute it over Z, you get like N, if you compute it over uh, R, you get one plus minus one plus one plus minus one, and then you get one or minus one, depending on the parity. So, I mean, yeah, so this is a simple example of how you can do this stuff, but you can compute more, more like a little more complicated varieties also in this, in this fashion, like just looking at uh, unions and products and this kind of stuff. Here, no, no, uh, it's just square root of minus one. Uh, because, yeah, it's L. Yeah, I'm adding because, yeah, exactly. Because, well, because this should be a morphism, right? So you know that this is minus one. So, of course, this should be minus one. So, <laughs> no, no, it's just like a formal, formal thing, yeah. <laughs> right okay yeah so but yeah it's just like a formal formal way of i mean to to extend the morphism because otherwise you have some problems here so i think i'm doing this in the wrong way <laughs> Okay, so before I proceed to define these motivic invariants, which are gonna be in this ring, uh, I want to tell you about another extension of this ring. So, um, how much time do I have? Okay. So, so instead of considering only varieties over K, we could consider uh, <clears throat> the following thing. So, so let this be the group of roots of unity. So over K bar, so the group of roots of unity and consider this to be the projective limit of all the groups of, of all the uh, groups of roots of unity. And then if you have uh, X, you say that a good action of this, this group uh, is simply an action for which uh, every orbit is contained in an affine subvariety. Um, of X, of course. And what's and uh, if you want, and a good action of me a hat is going to be simply an action which factors through a good action of some me n, right? So this is a good action. And then you can consider, instead of considering just varieties, you can consider varieties equipped with a me action, a good me hat action. 
okay? So that means that this action will factor through some through one of the mu n's, and this action is going to be good in the sense that the orbit is contained in an affine subvariant. If x is projective, this is going to be satisfied. Uh, and now you can consider the free abelian group generated by these things the same way, and you can consider uh, the same relations. So these relations like this, the same idea. And uh, again, you're gonna get a group. There's another relation which is important. So if you have like a, a product X times V where V is an affine space, uh, then this is going to be the same thing as x times a n, where me n x trivially, trivially on this a n. So any action, any product like this with an action, so we say that the action can be trivialized. And this is going to be called k0 of me star bar. So basically what we are doing is considering, instead of looking at only varieties, we are looking at varieties with an action of this, uh, these roots of unity. And this is gonna be important for defining this motivic invariance. Uh, somehow this, uh, these actions uh, will, will encode some, well, I mean, I'm gonna explain what they will, where they will play a role now. So, okay, finally, we can look at uh, what we want to do. So finally, we can talk about this motivic thing variant after this ring story, motivic. Right, so, so what is our idea? So remember that, uh, when this, when the, this, uh, or zero, when this was like nice or smooth, we could just consider, uh, so we can take, so let's call beta here. We can take the editing variant. And when this was nice, this was just the Euler characteristic, right? So now what we want to do is define an invariant here in this ring or K or, but let's say C first, uh, for which, uh, well, when you apply the Euler characteristic here, you want this to commute. And of course, if, if the space is smooth, you could just take the class of this space here as a variety and compute the Euler characteristic and everything would be nice. But in general, this is not smooth. So you can just take uh, the, the class of it here. So you have to find a way to define these invariants. And this is what motivic invariants are. So you are taking your, your moduli space, you are defining a, a virtual motive, that's how people call it, which is an element here and when you take the Euler characteristic of this element here to Z, you get the DT invariant. So that's what you want to do here, right? So you want to make this diagram commute, but you don't know very well how to uh, compute this, but you know for many cases and the case in which I will uh, want to, the case I will want to consider today is the case in which you have a map uh, from X to, to C, for example. So now I, I'm gonna talk about C, but most of the things can be generalized later, but this, this was firstly defined, first defined like for, for C. So let's stick to C for now. Uh, sorry, I, mean, <laughs> I keep like going uh, from one field to the other all the time, but I, I hope it's not so confused. So you have a map like this, regular. 
and suppose that X is smooth. And then you can consider the critical locus of this, of this map. And this was already considered in Julia's talk, like a similar thing. So in this situation, you want to define uh, a class, a virtual class here, which correspond to uh, this, this the thing variant. So suppose you can write your moduli space as a critical locus, then you want to define this class. So that's what we want to do. And this was done by, so, so you have the work by Deneff and Lozer, Lozer, and then in, in their work, they defined a class SF. So for when you have like a map like this, which is actually in this ring here uh, of where C. Uh, and how, how you can define this class, I mean, I'm not gonna give you the, the full definition, but basically you consider a resolution of, so you have X and K, you have, x0 here, which is the central fiber, and you can consider a resolution for which y0 is just simple normal crossings. And then after you do that, uh, using the simple normal crossings, you can define uh, uh, an element here. And the, 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 the role that this, uh, these groups play is that when you do that, you have some uh, uh, multiplicities here. And for each uh, divisor here with a multiplicity, you have like an action of roots of unity. And yeah, so that's the role this thing plays. So that's how you define this, uh, this SFs. And then uh, to Using this SF, you can finally define a motivic version of this DT invariant for this case. And I hope I have time to go. So when do I have to finish? It's 45. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Forty-five. Okay, so I have fifteen minutes, right? More or less. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be okay. So right. So after you have this S F, you can simply define this virtual class to be uh, simply the product L to the minus dimension of X over two times uh, S F minus the class of X zero. So basically what we are doing is the following. So let me explain kind of the intuition behind it. So this is somehow a, a, a motivic incarnation of the Muner fiber of this map, right? And the idea is that you are taking, when you do that, you take off this X zero. So you, you somehow take off the smooth part of X zero and then you stay only with this singular locus. So that's what you are doing like uh, intuitively. And this L, to the minus dimension of x over two, this will play the role of the sign because if you recall this L to the minus two is gonna be, this L to the minus a half is gonna be, when you apply the Euler characteristic, this is gonna be minus one. And then you have minus one to the dimension, which is uh, what you wanted. Okay. And 
This definition is in the work of Behan, Brian, of and Zendroy, Troy, and they have another uh, fact that they they prove and uh, for so and they have this theory that if you have uh, uh, if there is a torus action on X, so recall that you are looking at the situation like this. So you have X smooth, and then you have Z inside of X. So if you have a torus action on X, uh, uh, equivariant, oh, or F and, sorry, and F, is equivariant with respect to this action or to to a character um, then then you then this virtual class can be computed simply by taking Uh, x1 minus x0. So you, you have like this generic fiber, and then you can, instead of having to compute this, this, this class here, you can just compute x1 and x0. And, but of course you have some conditions here on this torus action. It's, it can't be any torus action. There are some conditions, uh, but which are related to, compactness but i uh i don't want to enter in the details of that and what i want to talk about now is how how you can uh, do this for the hilbert scheme of points so how can you look at the hilbert scheme of points of A3 as uh, a critical locus like this. Uh, I think this is somewhat, I don't know how classical this is, but I, I'm gonna do it anyway, just to show you how, how this works. Uh, but, and then in the last five minutes, I want to say some words about uh, all these things, like how what we think that might be happening, and how one could address this uh, these problems relating these definitions over uh, these things. I didn't re really have had time to talk about the Grothendieck victory. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna maybe explain this about the Hubert scheme, and then I'm gonna try to say some words of things I want you to say. So, okay. So, uh, well. So the Hilbert scheme, so let HN be the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of A3. And this is simply, as you know, uh, ideals of, so dimension zero subschemes, which are simply ideals here, uh, for which the dimension x one x two x three over i equals n. Okay, and uh, the thing is that you can write this as a critical locus of a function, and I'm gonna just say what it is and then explain why. So you consider this variety here, uh, or K3, a three times Kn, 
uh, and we ask that V generates Kn via this under this action, under uh, the action of A, B, and C. We take the quotient by G, L, N. This is a smooth variety, okay? So basically, so let me explain where this is coming from. So this is a vector space of dimension N. So that's why you have Kn here. Each of these x1, x2, and x3 is one of these a, b, and c. So it defines an action in this vector space. And this v corresponds to a choice of a one here. So you choose one here. So you want one to generate everything under the action of this x1, x2, x3. So that's why you choose this. And then of course you have to uh, take the quotient by the action of g, l, n, which is conjugating in the first three coordinates and then applying. Uh, I mean, acting on V usually. And this is a smooth variety. And then you can define a map here, which is just computing uh, the trace of A times the commutator of B and C. Notice that this is the same thing as computing uh, B times a C or C or A B times C. These are all the same uh, function. So in the end, what happens is that when you compute the derivative of this function, you're gonna get that uh, the, the, the critical locus is exactly where the, the matrices A, B and C commute. And if the matrices commute, this is gonna, mean that they are, they, they, this action like um, factors through the symmetric group, which is simply this polynomial ring. So, uh, so that's how you see the Hilbert scheme of points as a critical locus. And now I want to, so the Hilbert scheme of points is gonna be a very good example if you want to check these things. So now I want to just say how you can uh, kind of try to start generalizing this for any k using the Grothendieck Wittering. Uh, we still have five minutes. So the so we have the following So the first thing is that this construction works over any k and also like you can define so if you are on this ring or maybe in this ring first, I want to explain that you can define a map, which is the A1 Euler characteristic with compact support here. How you define this map? So you recall that uh, this, uh, this, this map, this, this ring can be generated. So you can see it as generated by projective varieties. And on projective varieties, this Euler characteristic is simply, uh, it, it can be seen as, as uh, the, the degree map of, uh, of the Euler class. So you have an Euler class. In a, if you are on a projective variety, you have an Euler class. You can define this over uh, in this, over any field in, in this A1 setting using what are called uh, show vit groups. I, I don't really have time to define this, but basically you have show groups in, in enumerative geometry or intersection theory, and you have show vit groups 
in this uh, A1 setting. So the same way Sabrina explained that you can define a degree here from the topological degree you have in the usual setting, we can define this show, this twisted show groups. And uh, things that are a bit more complicated, you have to, in order to compute degrees here, you have to make sure that your classes are orientable. Uh, but for the for the Euler class of the tangent uh, tangent bundle, it's always orientable, so you can always define this for projective varieties. And as this is generated by projective varieties, you can define this morphism. Okay, you could you could also define this by other means in this A one homotopy theory, but I want to stick to to this show idea because it's maybe easier in some sense. But okay, so the point is that you can define this morphism here and, and, and you could also define uh, that SF, so this SF, this class could also be defined over any field K. Uh, by simply, because, I mean, this is the work of Deneff and Lozère, they actually work it over any field K of characteristic zero. And so in principle, you could try to define like a, 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 a virtual class using this SF over any field and using this Euler, A1 Euler characteristic to define some a1 DT invariant, for example, uh, but we we still can't do this in this example because in order to compute that formula for the Hilbert scheme, you need to use this result here. So you actually need, and this result only worked over C, this Torus action result, and. Uh, so we actually are still not very sure of how to, how can we like make these definitions over any field. But the point is that we can, of course, take the formula we, we for, for the, the DT invariant of the Hilbert scheme, which I wrote in the beginning. And we can, of course, compute, uh, compute this, uh, this, this these numbers, this DT invariant over R, and we can also compute some invariants here just by like making L uh, equals to minus one or making L equals to uh, minus one in the Grothendieck bit. So uh, the, the thing is that, so let me write some stuff. We can uh, compute uh, real and GW valued, uh, real and GW valued counts. Uh, but uh, we don't yet know, know uh, how to properly explain this. And we have some ideas for to explain this. So, and this is gonna, with these ideas, I'm gonna end my talk. So first thing is that uh, classically, this DT invariant for Hilbert schemes are computed by localization. So I think that this, this theorem here has something to do with localization because you have a torus action here. And of course this torus action will induce a torus action in your uh, singular locus. So one idea would be like to try to find some relations uh, with Levinas work on localization. So, So there is some work made by Mark Levine on 
localization in this A1 setting. So this would be an idea. So if you can prove a similar theorem to this one in this A1 setting, then you would explain everything, especially the real counts. And another idea would be to relate uh, EKL classes with the Milner fiber, this motivic Milner fiber, SF, So we have SF, we have this EKL classes, which are defined also in this Grothendieck Wittering for, for a map. And this, this is a work by Vickelgren and Katz in which they, they were able to even compute some Munner numbers in, in, this, in this ring. So we all, this is also another, uh, way to try to 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 explain why this real and complex counts are walking together and well yeah that's basically what i had to say thank you very much uh, we have time for a few short questions Anybody? Uh, I didn't define it. So the names of the first, the people I can, well, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I didn't define these classes, but basically ah, the names, Eisenberg, Kim Shashvili and Levine. <laughs> the names are Eisenberg, Kim Shashvili and Levine. And basically the, this thing is, if you have a, so the idea is that if you have a map from a n to a n, uh, <clears throat> you want to to show that the degree of this map uh, is somehow related to to the Jacobian ideal of this f. So this is done like in the real setting and in the complex setting, like a long time ago, but in the work of Vickelgren and Cass, they did it for this context in GD in Grothendieck V of K. So this is relating Jacobian ideal and degree, topological degree. Yeah, so basically. Anybody else with a question? Well, then let's thank the speaker again. And, and we resume at 4.15. <laughs>